Welcome to a new edition of The Criminal Library, where we explore the dark recesses of crime and justice. Today, we will delve into a case that shook both Argentina and Spain, and that still resonates in the hearts and minds of those who lived through it. We are talking about Fructuoso Alvarez Gonzalez, the man behind the horrendous Flores Massacre. An act of revenge that transcended all limits, where a debt led to a hellfire, consuming five innocents in their home. This crime occurred on February 17, 1994, in Buenos Aires, and although the author was sentenced to life imprisonment, his story did not end with his sentence. Judicial errors, extradition, and subsequent threats added layers of complexity and horror to this tale. Join us as we unravel the details of this chilling case, from the profile of the victims to the circumstances that allowed the killer to walk free, even after being convicted. Prepare for a haunting journey in The Criminal Library, where truth is often stranger than fiction. We start. Classification, Mass Murderer. Features, Revenge, Fire. Number of Victims, 5. Date of Crime, February 17, 1994. Date of Birth, 1960. Victims, Jose Bagnato, 42, his wife Olga Plaza, 40, his sons Fernando, 14, and Alejandro, 9, and the boy Nicholas Borda, 11. Crime Method, Fire. Location, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Status, Sentenced to Life Imprisonment on November 10, 1995. Fructuoso Alvarez, arrested in Argentina an Asturian who burned five members of a family alive in 1994. December 5th, 2011. Fructuoso Alvarez, 51, sentenced to life imprisonment and released in 2008 for a judicial error, has changed homes 47 times in recent years to escape justice. He burned down the house of his partner, who apparently owed him money, and not only caused the death of him, but his wife, two children aged 14 and 9, and a friend of the children, aged 11, who burned inside the house. Another son of the couple was able to survive by jumping out of a window. It happened on February 17, 1994, in a chalet in the Buenos Aires neighborhood of Flores, in Argentina. The author of that brutal crime, known as the Flores Massacre, the Asturian Fructuoso Alvarez Gonzalez, was sentenced to life imprisonment in November 1995, a sentence that was confirmed a year later. In 2004 he was extradited to Spain but in 2008 the Asturian was released from prison when justice considered that he had purged the crime, applying the usual benefits for work inside prison. The problem is that Alvarez Gonzalez had falsified the information provided to the Spanish judges, according to sources close to the case. And it is that the documentation presented indicated that he had been in prison since 1992, three years before his actual imprisonment. The Spanish courts, upon learning of this, issued a warrant for his capture. Since last July, the Asturian Argentinian was in search and capture, and the day before Saturday the airport security police finally arrested him in a country house in the Tortuguitas neighborhood, on the outskirts of Buenos Aires. Today, Monday, the sentence execution judge will decide if Alvarez is extradited back to Spain or if he serves the remainder of his sentence in Argentina. According to the Argentine media, at the end of 2008, when the Asturian was released in Spain, Fructuoso Alvarez returned to Argentina, it is believed that with false documentation. In these three years, a total of 47 addresses are known. In addition, every three months he traveled to Uruguay and re-entered Argentina to obtain a new tourist visa. The case returned to the front pages of the newspapers at the beginning of this year, when the son who had managed to survive the fire, Matias Bagnato, who became known for participating in the Argentine version of Big Brother, denounced that the his family's killer was threatening to kill him. According to what he told the Argentine press, they were short calls, in which he told him, you're dead. According to him, he said, this situation had been going on for two years. Fructuoso Alvarez Gonzalez was born in Asturias in 1960, but a year later he moved to Argentina with his family, according to sources close to the case. 
At the time of the crime he ran a car dealership and had a shoe factory with Jose Bagnato. Apart from business, the two had a family relationship, since Alvarez was married to a cousin of Olga Plaza, Bagnato's wife. According to the Argentine media, the motive for the crime was a debt of 200,000 pesos, about 35,000 euros, that Alvarez claimed from Bagnato. The Asturian decided to take justice into his own hands. A neighbor from Flores, a middle-class neighborhood in Buenos Aires, saw him carrying a can of gasoline with which he would later spray the house to set it on fire. In the sentence, it was highlighted that he had a psychopathic personality. Matias Bagnato's lawyer, Rogelia Pazzi, maintains that the Asturian orchestrated his extradition to Spain in some way. He no longer has relatives on this side of the Atlantic, so he could hardly claim his transfer to a Spanish prison. His sister, however, offered to live for a while in Spain to pretend a family ties that did not exist, always according to the lawyer. Subsequently, the judicial error of his release would occur, induced by the false information provided to the Spanish authorities by the murderer. We hope that he will serve the remainder of his sentence here in Argentina, said lawyer Rogelia Pazzi. The lawyer recounted the fear in which her client, who was 16 years old when the crime was committed, had lived since she began receiving calls from the Asturian. Matias lived in fear, locked up at home like in a jail, unable to work, said the lawyer. According to the lawyer, the Asturian should have served 25 years in Spain, the minimum sentence for those sentenced to life imprisonment. The story of Nicholas, the boy who was left in the middle of the tragedy. September 25, 2011. He was 11 years old. Friend of the minor of the Bagnados, he died in the fire. His mother found out about what had happened on the radio. Lucila Garcia de Borda, 66, is a mother of pain, like so many others who inhabit Argentine soil. She still reproaches herself today for having allowed the youngest of her five children, Nicholas, 11, to sleep that fateful night in the Bagnado house. The boy had gone to play in the afternoon with Alejandro Bagnado, 9, but the woman's idea was to look for the two to sleep at her house, about 20 blocks from each other, because the next morning she was going to take the bus line 29 to spend the day with both of them at the Vicente Lopez Marina Club. In addition, Nicholas had never stayed to sleep in someone else's house. Until that night. He was not one to go out much, he preferred that they come home. He had a hard time separating from me. He was the most attached, says Lucy, married to Roberto Borda, 67, a former employee of the Naval Center who, after the murderer's trial, suffered a stroke that required three years of recovery. Her other children are Maria Delfina, 39, Augustin, 35, Maria Lucila, 32, and Ignacio, 31. After several years of silence before the media, Lucy unloads on her and exudes her anger because the murderer is free of her. Did you know about the threats? Claren asks him. And she answers, they never told me anything. She lashes out at Fructuoso Alvarez Gonzalez, the person responsible for the massacre, none of the boys had anything to do with it. It was an adult problem. On February 16, 1994, Nicholas was going to stay until 6 in the afternoon at Alejandro's. I was going to pick them both up, I was going to bring them home because it was more comfortable for me to go to the marina club and because I didn't have a vehicle. A few minutes before leaving I don't know who came that I was late. He called me Alejandro on the phone, asking if he would let Nicholas stay the night. I didn't want to, but my mother came to the phone and she told me leave them, I'm going to make the Milanese and French fries. At 11 o'clock at night, she called his son again. I asked him if he was okay, if he wanted to stay. He said to me, he doesn't matter to me. I tell him, then I'm going to look for you. No, no, because I'm going to have a good time, he told me. And there it was, he says. The next morning her husband traveled to Uruguay, not knowing what had happened to her son. She heard the news on the radio, very early, when she began to listen to the Magdalena Ruiz Ginazo program. She took a taxi and when she got home they were taking out the charred corpses, covered with sheets. 
When I saw such a disaster I lost consciousness of everything. I think to this day I sometimes look for it, she explains. With the assassin free, she warns, I would like to kill him myself. It is very cruel, I am Catholic, perhaps it is an angry thought that I have, because what is happening is outrageous. I don't know whether to think that there is bribery and there is no justice, she asserts. Lucila feels that the criminal also killed her. I think he totally cut my life off. It is a situation of surviving, not living. That I continue on the street I cannot tolerate it. Put your batteries and look for it. I want him jailed or dead. I don't take Nicholas out of the ground anymore. I chose the best place for him so that he can rest in peace, but I don't let him rest in peace because the other one is not where he should be, buried just like him. The court rejected an appeal from the person convicted of the Flores massacre. November 9, 2015 Fructuoso Alvarez Gonzalez was sentenced to life imprisonment for setting fire to the house of Jose Bagnato in 1994. Five people died, three of them minors, and only Matias, the eldest of the brothers, survived. The Chamber of Cassation has to decide on a defense request to access temporary exits. The Supreme Court of Justice of the Nation declared inadmissible an appeal presented by the author of the well-known, Flores Massacre, Fructuoso Alvarez Gonzalez, who was sentenced to life imprisonment for having set fire to the house of Jose Bagnato, with whom he had problems for a debt, in 1994. The night of the fire, five people died, three of them minors, and only Matias survived, the eldest of the brothers who was able to escape. Sponsored by Adrian Tenka, the same lawyer who defended goalkeeper Nestor Mangieri in the trial for the femicide of Angelus Rawson, Alvarez Gonzalez went to the country's highest court to prevent his criminal execution file from continuing to be open. But judges Ricardo Lorenzetti, Elena Heithan and Juan Maqueda declared an appeal inadmissible using Article 280 of the Civil and Commercial Code, which allows the court not to argue its decision. In this way, the court, in the sentence signed on November 3, confirmed a sentence of Room 3 of the Federal Chamber of Criminal Cassation that ratified what was done by the Judge of Criminal Execution No. 3, Jose Perez Arias, who resumed the control of the effective fulfillment of the sentence of the murderer of the Bagnato family and made a new calculation of the sentence. Last week the news broke that the National Chamber of Cassation has in its hands the treatment of a request from the defense of Alvarez Gonzalez to access transit exits in the framework of serving the sentence for the murder. The request is pending resolution in the admissibility chamber of that court, made up of judges Eugenio Cerebiris, Horacio Diaz and Pablo Jantis. The only relative who testifies is a niece who never visited him in prison, the only survivor, Matias Bagnato, told Infojust News to contextualize the request made by the defense of Alvarez Gonzalez. The criminal execution judge Perez Arias rejected the incorporation of Alvarez Gonzalez to the benefit taking into account reports and expert reports made to the inmate that establish, for example, that, he has not managed to modify his position regarding the crime nor has he developed a process of self-criticism and reflection as recorded by the criminological service. Although he uses the space and shows himself to be collaborative and empathetic, manipulative behaviors and actions are observed in his speech tending to achieve his personal benefit over commitment or the bond with the other, highlights another report on the condemned. Court History In February 1994, Fructuoso Alvarez Gonzalez complied with the threats he had made against the Bagnato family for days, he set fire to the house where they lived and murdered Jose Bagnato, 42, his wife Alicia Plaza, Fernando and Alejandro, 14 and 9, and Nicholas Borda, a friend of the boys, 11 years old. Matias, 16 years old, was the only one who could escape. On November 10, 1995, Alvarez Gonzalez was sentenced by the Oral Criminal Court No. 12 of the Capitol to life imprisonment. In 2004 Alvarez Gonzalez participated in a prisoner exchange with Spain, and was released in Europe due to an error in the calculation of his sentence. Alvarez Gonzalez returned to the country and began to intimidate Matias. Moreover, as a result of the threatening calls suffered by Bagnato, it was found that the convicted person had been released in Spain. 
Then the National Court of Criminal Execution ordered the reopening of the supervision file of the execution of the sentence and a new calculation of the sentence was carried out that was confirmed by the Federal Chamber of Criminal Cassation. Now the Supreme Court rejected the condemned man's complaint about the decisions of the Federal Cassation. The tragic story of Nicholas, his family, and the events of the Flores Massacre, leaves us with profound lessons and reflections. Grief and loss. The loss of a child is an unimaginable tragedy, and the manner in which this incident occurred amplifies that grief. The words of Lucila Garcia de Borda, Nicholas's mother, illustrate the ongoing suffering and incomprehensible loss that continues to affect her. Failure in the judicial system, the release and possible temporary departures of Fructuoso Alvarez Gonzalez, together with his unrepentant and manipulative attitude, highlight an apparent failure in the judicial system. The perception of a lack of justice not only increases the pain of families, but can also undermine trust in legal institutions. Community impact, this event not only affected the families involved, but also left a deep mark on the community. Sadness and fear can have a lasting impact, especially when those responsible for such crimes are not effectively punished. The importance of reflection and repentance in rehabilitation, reports on Alvarez Gonzalez's attitude in prison show a lack of repentance and self-criticism. This raises important questions about what is needed for true rehabilitation and how these cases should be managed within the criminal justice system. Friendship and human connection, despite the tragedy, the story also speaks of friendship and human connection. Nicholas and Alejandro were close friends, and Nicholas's mother trusted the Bagnato family. These human ties and mutual trust are fundamental to any society and must also be remembered and valued. Call to action and responsibility, Lucila's final words express an urgent call to action and a demand for responsibility. Her message is not just a cry of personal pain, but a reminder for society and the authorities to act with integrity and commitment to seek justice. In conclusion, the story is a poignant reminder of how a tragedy can have a far-reaching and lasting impact on individuals and communities. She calls us to reflect on fairness, empathy, human connection, and how we value and protect those qualities in our society. She also highlights the importance of a well-functioning judicial system and taking into account the need for true rehabilitation and repentance in the treatment of criminals. Dear listeners of the Criminal Library, we have come to the end of this deeply moving and meaningful episode. The story we have shared today is not easy to process, and can leave us with many conflicting emotions and thoughts. As a community, we have the power to learn, reflect, and grow together. Your comments and opinions are vital to us, and we invite you to share your thoughts in the comments section below. If this content has resonated with you and you want to continue exploring more cases with us, please, like, and subscribe to our channel. Every like, every subscription, means a lot to us and helps us continue to bring these important narratives to more people. From the Criminal Library team, we want to express our sincere thanks for joining us on this journey. Your presence and support encourage us to keep going, sharing stories that matter and building a compassionate and empathetic community. Take care of yourselves, and we'll meet again in the next episode. Until then.